Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture in our aircraft flight mechanics uh, course. We're looking, continuing with aircraft performance. We're going to be moving into climbing and gliding flights. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking at steady level flights, whereby the aircraft maintains the same altitude so we can rely on lift equaling weight, thrust equaling drag. So we can rely on those. We're now looking at climbing. So actually this, uh, this image is a cool image, um, I like it. We're not looking at this sort of climbing. We're looking at climbing at small angles of incidence, or small, sorry, small flight path angles. I like this though, because it's a good image, and I've inadvertently matched my shirt to the background today. So, before we delve into this, I need to do some explanation about some of the angles that we're using. If you pick up one of the aircraft performance textbooks, certainly the one that I recommend, the Anderson textbook, you will see the climb and the glide angle, sorry, climb and the glide angle referenced as theta. And indeed, in my original PDF notes, I called it theta as well. Now, because this course goes from aircraft performance into aircraft flight mechanics, we will be using theta as the aircraft pitch angle, as one of the Euler angles later. So it's not quite correct to call the climb or glide angle theta. And I'm going to talk about the differences between aerodynamic incidence, which we call alpha, the Euler pitch, which is theta, and then the flight path angle, which is actually the climb or glide angle, which we're going to use gamma to represent. So let's just have a quick look at the images. Let's put my iPad up. Oh no, my iPad isn't working. I might have to... One second, let's find this. Right, okay, so I finally have my screen working again. Um, I think sometimes when I let the computer go to sleep overnight, it sort of forgets how to how to work. So um, we're going to talk about these, uh, these angles and how we describe aircraft flights. And we're going to look at this much more in module three, where we look at relative motion and we need to describe the Euler angles, which help us determine the aircraft attitude. Well, they enable us to determine the aircraft attitude. The aircraft attitude is a relationship or is or is a set of angles that can describe the aircraft's orientation relative to the earth. So effectively it's a measure of which way the noise is sorry the nose is pointing. And for climbing and gliding we're going to be looking at effectively we're just looking at it, the aircraft from the side. So the angle that describes which way the aircraft is pointing is theta. Theta is positive nose up positive nose up because our y-axis is along the aircraft's starboard wing. So you put your thumb across the start, the right hand across the axis and then positive rotation gives us nose up. This image might be, might be reversed so that might be slightly confusing. But theta describes the aircraft pitch. Now it doesn't necessarily describe the way the aircraft is flying. So if an aircraft is flying at high angle of attack, the actual velocity vector or the flight path is not in the same direction. So the orientation between the velocity vector, the wind vector, and the aircraft is defined by alpha, the angle of attack, and beta if we're looking at side slip. The orientation between the way the aircraft is actually flying and the earth is defined by the flight path angle, which is gamma. So that probably doesn't mean much just talking about it in words. So let's draw a diagram. So I've got a nice F-22 here to show that I can use American aircraft as well. Let's have a look at some of these angles and what they mean. So if we have the aircraft x-axis, so if we draw a line through the aircraft, this is aligned effectively with the way the aircraft is pointing. We've got, we could draw a plane that's parallel to the ground as well. Remember that in flight mechanics, we treat the aircraft as a, sorry, we treat the earth as a flat plane. We're not flat earthers, we just pretend we are for aircraft flight mechanics. And then the aircraft could be flying in a direction that is neither of these effectively. So if the aircraft is flying in, say, this direction, then the velocity vector sub it goes through the two lines there. So we've got different angles that we can define here. We've got the angle between, the, let's just um, annotate these lines slightly. Let's say this is green is aircraft, blue is earth, and red 
is wind, okay? Because that's the nomenclature that we're going to be using later when we look at axis systems. So the angles that help us define the relationships between these frames, so between the aircraft and the wind, is the angle of attack, alpha. The line between the aircraft, but the, between the aircraft axes, and then to the earth is theta. So this angle here is theta, which is pitch. And there's one angle left, which is the angle between the earth and the wind vector, and this is given the symbol gamma, which is the flight path angle. Okay, so we've got these three different angles here. Now, if you look in some of the performance textbooks, you'll see that this angle theta, or the symbol theta, is used to dictate the glide angle or the climb angle. Now, that's not, it's correct in those textbooks because that's the nomenclature they're using. But when we go into aircraft flight mechanics, the Euler angles, which are theta, psi, and phi are incredibly important and those are universally defined as theta, phi, theta, psi and phi. So we need to keep that nomenclature constant. Now if we're talking about the glide slope now effectively, if we're looking at the way the aircraft is flying, the angle that we're talking about is actually the flight path angle. So we're going to talk in terms of gamma. And you can probably see from the above, we can see that actually gamma is equal to theta minus alpha. These angles are all defined in, uh, with this as their positive definition. So if we had no angle of attack, you could use theta to define the aircraft glide slope or the, um, or the climb slope. Now, we're also going to be using the same angle to determine the aircraft glide and the aircraft climb slope. So by this definition we've got up here, glide should be a negative gamma. And that's going to be a little bit annoying to keep having it as negative, so we'll introduce a gamma bar, and that's simply equal to the absolute value of gamma. And so we're going to be using this to dictate climb or glide slope. Or sorry, the climb or the glide angle. So that's what we're going to be using in the following. If you look in the PDF notes, I used theta to describe the angles. And I just realized it gets a little bit confusing when we move into flight mechanics and we use theta as one of the Euler angles. And all it comes from the fact that my aircraft performance follows a lot of the methodologies of the Anderson textbook and then for flight mechanics, I move into what I was effectively taught as an undergraduate, which is these angles. These are pretty universal. Theta, sometimes you'll see it being used to represent the glide angle. If you look in Tom Yekout's book, he uses this approach. So we're gonna use this to represent our climb or glide angle. So that's the angles down. These will be updated on the website. So I'm using the same nomenclature by the time you guys actually use this course. So let's firstly look at gliding. So in steady level flights, aircraft flying along at constant altitude. In a glide, the aircraft is now, might have some incidents, but we are flying along at an angle where the aircraft flight path is now pointed down towards the earth. So let's have a look at how we can model this. So glide, firstly, is unpowered descent. So immediately, that tells us that thrust is equal to zero. Now if I draw an exaggerated aircraft glide, then we can draw our angles, so we can draw our different angles on here, and we can also draw the force components. So again, blue is the one that's that's aligned with the earth, 
our aircraft is now flying in this direction. So we've got our angle in here, which we're calling gamma bar, and this is our glide angle. The forces that we have, well, normal to the velocity vector, we've got lift, parallel to the velocity vector, we've got drag, and then down towards the center of the Earth, or just downwards in Earth axes, we have the aircraft weight. So we can sort of see what's going on here with no thrust. What we're actually doing is using part of the aircraft for a, for a steady glide, certainly. We're using part of the aircraft weight to counteract the aircraft drag. And that's just to make sure we make that as clear up here, steady. So the climbs and the glides that we're looking at are all steady, i.e. no acceleration. So we can look at the components of this W. We've got a component that is parallel to the lift and a component that is parallel to the drag. So this angle in here is also gamma bar. I wrote theta there by accident. So this component here is W sine gamma bar and this one here is W cosine gamma bar. So since our aircraft is steady, or it's, we, we have got no acceleration, we can use the equilibrium condition to develop some relationships that will help us determine some useful things about gliding flights. Let's go over here. So since we have no acceleration, we must know that the sum of the forces is equal to zero on the aircraft. So we'll look at the components that are parallel to the flight path and normal to the flight path. So parallel to the flight path, we've got in the positive direction, we've got W, w sine gamma bar is equal to the drag. Okay, so what does that tell us? We can say immediately that sine gamma bar is equal to the drag divided by the weight. So we have we can now determine the glide angle if we know the drag and the weight. We'll also look at the components that are normal to the flight path. So let's zoom in here. We can see normal to the flight path. Uh, that, that's a little bit small, so let's zoom in here. So normal to the flight path, we've got lift, and we've got this component, W cosine gamma bar. W cosine bar has to be equal to the lift. So therefore, cosine gamma bar is equal to lift divided by the weight. And again, we've got this glide angle in here. So we've got two relationships for the glide angle, one of which is the lift divided by the weight, one of which is the drag divided by the weight. So it would be useful if we could get rid of the weight from both of those. So we'll divide one by the other and come up with a, a new relationship. So sine gamma bar divided by cosine gamma bar, which by definition is equal to tangent of gamma bar going to be drag divided by weight divided by lift divided by weight, which is drag divided by lift, which is CD on CL. And let's write that slightly differently. Let's write CD on CL is equal to the arc tangent of gamma bar. Now, Let's have a think about the significance of this expression we've just developed. What we've shown here is that the glide angle is not a function of the aircraft weight. The glide angle is just a function of the aerodynamic properties of the airframe.
so that's really interesting. We can say that the aircraft glide angle, doesn't matter how heavy the aircraft is, in terms of this relationship, the glide angle will remain the same. You might find that for a given weight, the actual glide, we might not be able to, to reach the, the lift coefficient required for getting the best glide angle, but that's so slightly beyond what we're looking at at the moment. So if we want to think about the significance of the glide angle now, we have the aircraft velocity vector, which is down towards the earth at this angle, gamma bar. We've got two components. We've got one down here, and we've got one in this direction. So this one here is our sink rate, and this one here is our horizontal speed. And because we haven't developed the relationships yet that help us where we can put these into, into earth axes, we'll call these V sink and V horiz, or V hori. We're not going to use it too much. So we can probably appreciate that if we want to get the best range out of the aircraft, we want this to be small and this to be big. Effectively, we want the biggest ratio between this and this. So if this is big compared to this, then that's going to happen at the lowest value of the glide angle. So that's going to tell us the situation where we can fly the furthest. farthest glide occurs at the lowest value, I put max there, that was stupid, occurs at the lowest value of the glide angle. Remember that gamma bar is equal to the arc tangent of CD divided by CL. So the lowest value of this is going to be given by the lowest value of this. And we already know what that is. That's going to be CL on CD max, which occurs at CL minimum drag, which we know is the square root of CD naught divided by K. And I've, that's behind my head, so let's move that up. So the best glide range occurs at CL minimum drag. And we already have developed an expression for CL minimum drag, which is pretty cool. So, what speed should we fly at to get the best range in a glide? So you might think, well, I know CL minimum drag. So therefore, do we fly at VMB? Do we, is that going to work for this? Well, let's have, a, let's have a think about it. So where did this come from? When we developed the minimum drag speed, that came from the aircraft speed equation. The aircraft speed equation is V is equal to the square root of W divided by a half rho S CL. And we use this equation with the equilibrium steady flight condition. Equilibrium steady flight, therefore, lift is equal to weight. Now, for our case, this isn't true because lift is equal to W 
cosine gamma bar. So does it matter? Well, let's work it out. So we cannot technically use VMD to get the best glide. So we've got T, we can use the aircraft speed equation again, and we can just put the minimum drag speed, and instead of using lift is equal to weight, we'll use this in the numerator here. Okay, so let's do that. We'll say the V for best glide. Let's just call it best glide there. We're not typically using, I'll, I'll, I won't necessarily give this a symbol that we'll carry on using. This has to be equal to W cosine gamma bar divided by a half rho S CL. And we already know that the best glide is at the CL minimum drag. So we could say this is W divided by a half rho S CL and D multiplied by cosine gamma bar all square rooted. So this term here, that is just, I keep writing under my head, sorry guys. This term here is just the minimum drag speed. This term here is always gonna be less than one going to be pretty close to one a lot of the time. So this shows us that actually our best range in a glide is at a speed that's ever so slightly slower than the minimum drag speed. Nope. I'm running out of space here. So we'll say V for the best glide range is slightly slower. And let's have a think about how much slower. Typical glider has a glide ratio of around about 50, which means that it can cover 50 horizontal units in the time it takes to sink one vertical unit. see this means if it falls by one it will travel 50 along the ground so we can therefore get the glide angle out of this so the glide angle out of this is going to be the arc tangent of um, 1 over 50 so let's see what that glide angle is Point zero one nine 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 radians. Which in degrees is one point one five. Just to give you an idea of what the size of these glide angles are. So let's have a look at what cosine of that is. Cosine of that is zero point nine 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 eight and then a whole bunch of zeros. So the square root of that
99.99%. So what have we just shown? For a, for a typical glide angle, or for a typical glider, the velocity for the best glide is equal to 99 no, sorry, let's say 0 0.9999 minimum drag. Okay, so we're so close that for gliders, we can just use this. Okay, we can make the small angle assumption and we'll just use this speed. Some of the reasons for that is that, again, these are reduced models for determining performance. And a lot of the assumptions that go into this, like we're using a drag model, um, mean that we simply don't have that level of precision in these models anyway. So, so this is good enough for what we're trying to get out of here. Okay. So what? So that is the glide angle that we're making. And let's have a think about the speed. Be, so we've done the uh, sorry, glide angle and the glide speed. Um, so that determines if we want to fly, if our engine cuts out and we have a, an aircraft that has a reasonable glide slope, we fly at a minimum drag speed and we can go as far as, well, we can go as far as possible in that glide. If we are looking at endurance, however, we're looking at flying for the longest period of time, it's not the angle that we care about. We want to think about the speed at which the aircraft is dropping. Okay, so if we're not concerned with range but with endurance, then we are concerned with sink rates, not glide angle. So we want to think about how fast the aircraft is plummeting towards the earth. Hopefully it's not plummeting, it is actually gradually exchanging gravitational potential energy for kinetic energy, which is exactly what's occurring in a glide. This sink rate, which is our speed at which the aircraft is approaching the earth, vertically, what that's doing, we are exchanging gravitational potential energy for kinetic energy, okay? So we are trying to maintain the condition in which the air, if we want to have the best endurance, we're not concerned about range now, it sort of follows that we want to fly at the condition where the aircraft is losing as little energy as possible. So logically, it follows that for best endurance, So we don't typically talk about power as being a unit of energy loss, but it is effectively the power required for the aircraft can be considered the amount of energy required to, to do anything per unit time. So that's what we've got. So as little energy as possible. So what we want is minimum power condition. And we 
we've already done some work on this. So we know that Vmp, we already know what that velocity is. We know that that velocity is equal to B divided by 3A to the power of a quarter. So we did that from looking at, remember, if you can't remember where we got this from, we got that power is equal to A V cubed plus B V to the minus one. So differentiating that with respect to velocity gives you the velocity that gives you the minimum power and that's where we got this one from. So that should be the speed that gives us the slowest sync rate, okay? And the reason I'm approaching it in this way and I'm saying, well, we, we think we know what the answer should be is because I want to introduce you guys to being able to intuit things about aircraft and then use some mathematics to show them. So we're starting out this problem thinking, okay, well, we want to find out the velocity that gives us the minimum sync rate. And logically, it should be this one. So we're going to look at the equilibrium equations during a glide and we're going to find that it's this. It's probably going to actually be something slightly different because of the small angle condition. So remember when we looked at the uh, when we looked at the I've lost my screen here. When we looked at the one that gave us the best range, it was a speed slightly slower than the minimum drag. So we suspect it's going to be a speed that's something around about this, but because of small angles, it's going to be something slightly different. So I'm going to show this using the small angle assumption, and I want you guys to look at the effect of making, if we don't use the small angle assumption, i.e. what's the relationship between this and the minimum sync rate. Okay, so let's think about our velocity at triangles again. So, so V-sync, the velocity here, and we don't really care about this horizontal one. We've got gamma bar there. So, V-sync is equal to our velocity multiplied by sine gamma bar. Sine gamma bar, we've already got an expression for this right back on this slide. We, nope, on this slide, we showed that gamma bar, uh, where is it? It's up here. Sine gamma bar is equal to drag divided by weight. So this is velocity multiplied by drag divided by weight. So our weight, remember we said that lift was equal to W cosine gamma bar. So weight is equal to lift divided by cosine gamma bar. But I'm going to make the small angle assumption. I'm going to say that weight is approximately equal to the lift. So when you guys go through and you want to look at the effect of the small angle assumption, you're going to have to just not make this assumption. You're going to keep W is equal to L over cosine gamma bar. So we're going to say that's approximately equal to velocity multiplied by drag divided by the lift. So that's equal to V multiplied by CD divided by CL. So let's write this back out again. V sync velocity multiplied by CD on CL. If we want this to be at a minimum, we need to minimize this somehow. So we've got to minimize both of these terms. So let's come up with another expression for V that has terms we, we care about. So that's CD or CL. We'll use the aircraft speed equation. V is equal to the square root of W cosine gamma bar divided by a half rho s cl, which subject to the small angle assumption is approximately equal to w divided by a half rho s cl. So we can say that v sync is equal to the square root of 2 w divided by rho s cl multiplied by CD divided by CL. So let's concatenate those aerodynamic terms.
Okay, so for our minimum sync rate, we've got a bunch of things we aren't con necessarily controlling. We're looking at, say, the we're going to look at um, the we're going to sorry we're going to keep these constant. We want to look at the aerodynamic coefficients that give us the minimum value of this thing here. So we'll say hence minimum sync is at minimum CD divided by CL to the three on two. So if it was, if it was going to be um, CD divided by CL, we'd know that would occur at the minimum drag speed. The minimum value of this is going to be something slightly different. So let's see when where this occurs. So CD divided by CL to the three on two. Let's rewrite this. Let's say that's CD naught plus K CL squared divided by CL to the three on two. And let's rewrite this even further. Let's say this is CD naught multiplied by CL to the minus three on two plus K multiplied by CL to minus three on two there. Okay, so that's gonna be CD naught, CL to the minus three on two, plus K, CL to the half, okay? So to get the minimum value of this, this will give us the minimum sync speed. So we want to differentiate this with respect to CL. So this is going to be minus three on two. CD naught multiplied by CL to the minus five on two plus a half K CL to the minus half. And this equals zero at minimum sync. So a half K CL to the minus one half is equal to three on two CD naught CL to the minus five on two. If we multiply or divide both sides by CL to the minus a half, what do we end up with? We've got one half K is equal to, that goes, this then becomes minus two. Okay, so that's three on two. CD naught, CL to minus two, and we get CL is equal to the square root of three CD naught on K. That's our lift coefficient for the minimum sink rate. Now, what did I say it should be? Well, I said that was our minimum power speed, so I haven't actually got that far yet. Um, to get the speed associated with this, we then put this into the aircraft speed equation again. put this into the aircraft speed equation. Remember V is equal to the square root W cosine gamma bar divided by a half rho S and then our CL is this term here. So we've got three CD naught on K. We're gonna make the small angle assumption again. I'm gonna say 
square root of the weight divided by a half. Let's just tidy that up a bit. Let's put that half up at the top. So two divided by rho s cd naught on k. So we've got nested square roots there. So we could write this as v is equal to some things that are in the I've got one square root over it, so that's 2w divided by rho s to the half multiplied by cd naught. That's where there should be a 3 in there. 3 cd naught on k to the quarter. Now remembering that b, sorry, a is equal to half rho cd naught s. B is equal to k w squared on half row s. This is equal to b divided by 3a to the quarter. And if you're not certain of that, take these, put them into here, and multiply it out, and you will get this. Okay? So we have shown that if we can make the small angle assumption, this is the speed that gives us the minimum sink rate. So I would like you guys to go through this not making the small angle assumptions. There's a few places you've got to go through. So here, keep this as cosine, W cosine gamma in there. Um, here as well, you've got to keep that in there. And then in here as well, you've got to keep it in here. So there's going to be some terms that continue through this cosine gamma. I'd like to see what the relationship is between those two velocities. How close is it to this for reasonable values of the glide slope or the glide angle? I've not done that exercise. I, I can see how to do it. I'll go through it after this. But I'd like you guys to go through that, talk about it on Slack. Okay, or come to office hours. We can talk about it there. Um, that brings us to the end of gliding flights. I'm going to take a pause now before we move on to climb. So let's... Uh, get the notes from behind me. We've spoken about a lot there. Um, I'm going to update the notes so everything's in terms of gamma bar and not theta. Um, those will be done by the time we actually start the semester. That's gliding flight. Su supremely important. Now if you haven't been I recommend to go gliding. I'm going to try and arrange some flights through a local gliding club for members of our faculty, sorry, for members of our, of our course. It's incredible. It's where you really understand the, the significance of these terms, where you can just adjust your attitude to change the speed that we're flying at. And you can see, well, actually, this, this is a condition that gives me the minimum sink rate. And what this, come, what this is then related to is the glider polar, which let's show you that. Um, that's the wrong browser. Let me get So this is the glider polar, and this is where we're looking at sink rate versus airspeed. So read through this. I'm not going to go through the derivation of this, but I want you to understand where it comes from. And again, you can look at where the graph is made from. So look at how I've produced this graph. This is typically a chart that will be shown in a glider flight manual or a glider aircraft manual. So just understand where this comes from and understand what's going through in this part. Okay, I'm going to leave you guys there and I will take a break and then I'm going to start recording climbing flights. Cheers.